How are we doing this morning? Pretty good. Okay, I've got told this morning. I'm doing the sermon this morning and it's on where Jesus says, I am the vine. Now, I've already, I'm wearing a green shirt and it was no coincidence, uh, it was kind of coincidence. I didn't mean to pick a green shirt when I'm talking about a vine, but I just wanted to share that with you. But God in his wisdom knew what I was going to be wearing. But this morning, what we do is we're coming to the seventh I am statement recorded in John's Gospel. So far we've explored Jesus the living water, Jesus the good shepherd, and last week Ken explained how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All of these I am statements took place in the upper room where Jesus and the disciples shared their last supper. John 15, though, captures the moment when the disciples and Jesus are making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was preparing his disciples for his pending crucifixion, his resurrection and his subsequent departure for heaven. Knowing how disturbed they would feel, he gave them this lovely metaphor of the true vine as one of his everlasting encouragements. It shows you just how much Jesus loves us, that he gives us this wonderful image of a vine. Jesus wanted his friends, not only those 11 uh, disciples, but those of all time, that's you and me, that we were not, that Jesus was not going to desert us, even though we would no longer see or enjoy his physical presence. His living energy, his spiritual reality would continue to nourish and to, sus and to sustain the disciples and us, just as the roots and the trunk of a grapevine produce the energy and that nourishes and sustains its branches while they develop their fruit. Jesus wanted us to know that even though we cannot see him, we are closely connected to Jesus as the branches of the vine are connected to its stem. Our desire to know and love Jesus and the energy to serve Jesus will keep flowing into us and through us as long as we remain close to Jesus. So I've asked Mel, in her very loud teacher voice, to read John 15, 1 to 17. Now, in your Bible, this is the red words in your Bible. These are the words of Christ directly to us, or directly to his disciples. And what I found fascinating with this is, this was Jesus talking just to his inner circle. This was him talking just to his disciples. It wasn't one of the parables that he shared to everybody. But he's sharing it to us as well today because it's in the red words in our Bible, which I love to focus on. So Mel, thank you so much. If you could read uh, John 15, 1 to 17, please. Servants don't know what 
goat and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command to you, love one another. Thanks so much, Mel. Just on verse 16 there, you didn't choose me. That was a direct link to how, I suppose, the, the disciples got chosen. Jesus went out and specifically called each and every one of the disciples. And that was so contrary to the day where people would go and, and, and seek out a rabbi. Would you be my rabbi? So this was completely different. So that's why Jesus is included it up there. So thanks heaps for that, Mel. There's so much, there's so much to unpack here. Now, just to, before we dive into that, um, my wife and I, Margaret, we went and had a holiday at Rather Glen in, in January. And we stayed at a vineyard, at the Di Portelli Vine or Vineyard. And it was a beautiful spot. I've got some pictures just up here at the back. And our room just overlooked the vineyard. So you could sit there and have your breakfast and everything like that. I found it very peaceful very calm. But what I really took particular notice of is it is there is so much order in a vineyard. Have you noticed in the picture from the rows, they're all in a straight line. They're all clean. There's not rubbish, there's not overgrowth around the base of them. There's a lot of care and attention that goes in to maintaining these vines. The whole purpose of the vine is not the vine. The whole purpose of the vine is the fruit. Right? And that's the whole essence of all this care and attention is to create the fruit. The other aspects which I will zoom in on toward the end of the sermon, but notice at the very front of the vineyard or of each vine row, there's a major strainer post. And then there's wires that run the length of those vines. And that's because the vines are actually connected to something. They're not just growing willy-nilly. They're connected into something. So it shows me that there's absolute order. And in this passage that Jesus is talking about, there is still an order that we follow. And when we follow it, things work out really well. So the next part that I want to break down from the passage that has just been read is that there's actually... The passage focuses on our relationships, but also our responsibilities. It's not something that we don't have to do anything to. And as a believer, we're actually called branches. And this is in um, John 15, 1 to 11. And as branches, we have a privilege of sharing in Christ's life and the responsibility of staying or abiding in this life. So sticking with it. But then the next part, the end part of this passage talks about friends. So we're in the vine, so it's like we're growing and we're maturing. And as we're growing and maturing, we're like little kids that grow up and as they grow up we're so no longer parenting that we become more friends with them. And Jesus is saying this is what happens with us as well we actually become more like friends. But I will unpack that just in a little bit as well. So Jesus is the true vine. The vine was one of the quintessential plants of Israel representing national peace and it's also represented prosperity and formed a prominent part of Israel's culture. We read about it in the Psalms, in Ezekiel, in Jeremiah, Hosea and Micah. All of these books figure Israel as the Lord's vineyard. So this background of Jesus using the vineyard in John 15, there's no coincidence, he's tapping into Old Testament right here. But he's kind of upgraded it, if you will. And the reason I say that is because in Isaiah 5, 1-7, it refers to Israel as not producing the expected fruit. So it wasn't fulfilling the purpose of what God wanted Israel to fulfill. And that was produce fruit for him. Produce fruit for a relationship and ensure a strong relationship with Christ. So Jesus has adjusted it. So Jesus replaces Israel as himself, as the true vine. Unlike Israel, Jesus will not 
fail to produce fruit in all the branches that are connected to him. And the point of Jesus' metaphor is that it, he will succeed where Israel actually failed. We simply need to be connected to him in order to do this. So there's four elements here. We're looking at the vine, the branches, the gardener, and the fruit. So let's unpack each one of these ones, shall we? So verse one, straight off. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. So for Jesus to say, I'm the true vine, we see an announcement that as the Messiah, Jesus is the only means of salvation and reconciliation to God. There's no other means for it. It's only through Jesus. Jesus is the one true source of spiritual life. And we have seen this repeatedly in John's Gospel. The Father is the one ultimately in charge, for example. It is the Father who sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world so that we can have this life in and through the Son. And it is the Father who, spend, who sends the Spirit to indwell, instruct and transform us. The other aspect I've got on the slide here that I'll, we're going to unpack more in the home group notes but there's three different vines that are portrayed in scripture. There's the past vine, which I did touch on, it was relating to Israel. There's the future vine, which is what's referred to in Revelation. That's kind of where there's a harvest of bad fruit. Right? And here we've got the present vine or the true vine, the vine of Christ. And this is where we're focusing today is the vine of Christ. So Jesus alone was the true vice, was the true vine. The worldview kind of claims that all kind of faith lead to, lead to the same God. But Jesus is very clear, and this is not the case. Jesus is the only means of salvation and reconciliation to God. So there's a massive separation right here. Jesus has drawn a line in the sand. For all of us now to realise the only way we have that salvation is through him. No other way. So we then have a role as branches. So as branches, we draw life from the vine. Like a grapevine or whatever the branches, that's where they produce the fruit from. They come back to the trunk. Paper. We do the same thing. So here, Jesus uses the relationship of branches to the vine to illustrate our relationship to him. I found the key phrase here was, in me. It's in me. And that is used 11 times in this verse. But that's the key, in me. We can only do anything through Christ or in Christ. And we can only do it when we're in the vine, when we're connected with him. We can't do things outside of him. Here Jesus speaks of mutually indwelling. The only way we can be spiritually alive is for us to live in him and he in us. The vine lives independently of the branches, but the branches can exist only if they remain in the vine and the, and the life of the vine is in them. So where do the branches live? They live in the vine, don't they? So how do the branches live? Only as the vine lives in them can the branches live. So both remain in me and I remain in you are essential for our spiritual life. Both express our utter dependence on Christ Jesus. So as we're, we're depending on him, he is with us, supporting us and encouraging us. The next aspect is the gardener. The gardener is in charge of caring for the vine. So who's the gardener? Well, God's the gardener. It is God's role to do the gardening. So as we read in 1 John 15, it is unthinkable that anyone... How about if I go back here? And on the slide in John 15 too, something that stood out for me. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't bear fruit and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit so that it can bear more fruit. So there's two lots of pruning going on. There's a cutting off and there's a pruning to create more fruit. So just like when you're gardening or whatever and you're trimming back your plant, 
and or you're trimming back flowers, for example, you want more blooms. So that's what you do. But then there's an element of actually cutting off, re completely removing something. So as we read in John 15, it's unthinkable that any branch who is connected to Christ will fail to produce fruit, right? So if we're connected to Christ, we have to produce fruit. In other words, fruit is us being like Christ, right? Yet, according to verse 2, some branches in him will not produce fruit and be taken away. So unfortunately, sometimes we can get this misguided notion that if we're not producing fruit or these branches aren't producing fruit, we've lost our salvation. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. What he's actually talking about is, and, and we get this in John 2, 23 to 25, what he's actually talking about is that there's, there were people that appeared to be connected to Jesus, but they were not. So to our eye, we thought they were wonderful Christian people, but they were not. But Jesus knew that they, that, that they weren't, right? So in verse 2, we have the removal of the non-genuine. Their character is non-genuine, is evidenced by their kind of fruit. So they might be angry, abusive, doing all things behind the scenes rather than, or show that they're kind of like Christ, but behind the scenes their behaviour is completely different. So where's Jesus kind of going with this? Well, if you think about Judas, I think he's a great example of what Jesus is getting at. For all intents and purposes, Judas appears to be connected to Jesus, didn't he? He was one of the disciples. He associated with Christ, and as far as the other 11 knew, he was just as much a believer as they were. But Christ, however, knew that he wasn't really with him. He was not clean. Judas was the branch in the vicinity of the vine, but he wasn't connected to it. And we learn this in John 6, 70, John 12, John 13, and as, and also, as well. So what we're getting a picture here is, is basically Jesus is saying that, also he's saying as well, that there are so many people that might portray, you know how there can be wolves among you? That's what Jesus is getting at. For all intents and purposes, they look the part, but they're not. So do, can we lose our salvation? No, we don't. And Jesus isn't talking about cutting us off. He's actually talking about those that were never with him in the first place. Right? There's a very big district, uh, discrepancy between the two. I hope that's cleared it up. There's more in the study notes on that as well that will help further unpack that one. So how does God prune? He can be pretty brutal, can't he? <laughs> Just quietly. So of course the Father does the pruning in our lives too so that you and I will become healthier and the purpose is for us to bear a lot of fruit. So I'm kind of thinking for myself when I first was prompted into ministry, I had two broken arms. Right? Did my breaking of my arms, did God cause that? No, my stupidity caused that. But God utilised that to guide me into ministry. So that was a big prune for myself. It was amazing. And since then, so many wonderful things have taken place. I'm also thinking as well, as a lot of you will know, unfortunately my mum um, is, is, took a stroke about seven and a half weeks ago. And she's still in hospital. And... That stroke has been a massive pruning to my mum. In the way that the way mum used to serve God and do things, she could no longer do them. It was gone. Can I tell you though, the fruit and the blessings that have come from this has been absolutely remarkable. We've had a reconciliation in our family. I. Um, my uh, a sister in particular, we haven't spoken to for 23 years, it was the passing of my dad that fractured us as a family. But through this, 
Jesus has healed that relationship. My sister came down and, and, and everything to see my mum. And my nieces were there as well. And they actually went and seen mum and they came out and they said, well, we, mum really knew us, well, they didn't, well, nan really knew us. And we just felt love. And I was like, dude, what were you expecting? She's always loved you. You know, that's never changed. And my mum and my sister were able to have a really good conversation. Although my can't speak very well, but nonetheless, the, in, in, in God's way, he, he made a way for that to get through. And it was so clear, and it really healed us as a family. And it's been so much tighter. We've also seen the way how mum can't do a lot of things in hospital, but the hospital staff know mum's different. They're understanding she's got a faith, and they're seeing that in her behaviour. They're seeing that she's never giving up, and she's caring and lovely to a lot of people. Sometimes not to those who fully loves, but that's another point. That can be coming out of frustration. Right? But that's an area that we also need to look at, which is a spiritual discipline that we have, because sometimes God can prompt us and also show us that in pain, that can bring out the worst in us, right? Or when things don't go well. But out of all that, he can also show us how far we've actually come and how far we've actually grown as well. So there's beautiful moments in that as well. So that's what I wanted to share on the way God kind of prunes as well. It can be painful and hurtful, but there's some phenomenal benefit at the end of it. And the whole purpose, and let's just remember, the purpose of pruning is for us to grow more fruit, to be better Christians, to be closer to Christ, to be imitating. Imitate? That's not the right word. Sorry? Imitate. Imitate's the word I'm trying to say. Is to imitate him better. Right? Okay, so what, after that, what is the fruit? Well, there we go. Imitate God. Look at that, top of the slide. So the fruit we produce is to serve others and not so much to pleasure ourselves. So we're doing it more to help other people. And how often do you find when you're doing something more to fill a need of someone else. You get a massive benefit out of that as well. God's loving in that. And we see that all the time as well. So the fruit we produce is to serve others, feed others through our words and our works. Proverbs 10.21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many. Hebrews 13.15 Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So the fruit that we're doing is actions and words and things that we're saying that glorify God. That's ultimately what the fruit is. It's not the size of your ministry, which is a big thing it took for me to get my head around for quite a while. It's not the size of the ministry. It's not the size of the lunchtime group at high school that's the important thing. That's not the issue. It's what you're doing with those people that is the important thing. How are you investing in each of their life? That's the important thing, being loving and caring and supporting to them. At school as well, it's, um, I do a lot of work with the LGBTQ plus group at school for those students. And the big thing that they say to me is, you don't, David, you just want to know me. I'm not a label. No, you're not a label. You're a person. I just want to know you. And it's amazing what, out of that love, what opportunities God opens up for them. That's fruit. Right? That is fruit. That's them also seeing the love of Christ without them knowing Christ. Yeah? Um, the next slide is Galatians. I think Galatians 5, 23, 22 to 23 is fantastic. It's love, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruits that God wants. Notice the top one there? It's love. It's out of everything is love. Jesus has done all this to love us. We're going to do all this to show his love to everyone else. And I think that's a big point that church, and I say church as in the broad church, is missing. 
I think we're not as loving as we probably need to be. We're not as loving to others. There's a lot of differences that we've got between us as Christians and the world right now. But that doesn't mean we can't be loving into that space, does it? Uh, and then when we're loving in that space, are we intensifying or magnifying the differences? No, we're not. We're, we're calming them down. And I think church is a massive step and a massive role to do in our community. So the last part I want to come to is friendship. Jesus' friendship with us is perfect. The Greek word, a friend in court, describes the inner circle around a king. Jesus is our king. We're here and we're to serve him. But if you think about it, a king's inner circle, they get to know the king. They actually get to know the secrets and the ideas of what the king has in store. But they also have to obey him. Jesus has given us that as well. He's actually calling us his friend. But he's also given us the vision of where he's taking the church, where he's taking us, how he's actually bringing the world eventually back to him and he's making it right. He's shared that intimate detail with us and therefore we've got a role to play in that. And I just, I just love that. And at school, when I talk to students about Jesus, I don't talk to them about, oh, this is God and this is Jesus. Oh, you want to know about my friend Jesus? This is what he's all about. Do you want to know him too? He can be your best friend as well. And that just calms everything down and then it opens them that they're willing to then explore who, who Jesus is. I'm not taking anything out of context here. This is scripture. Jesus is saying, oh, you are my friends. Right? And it's a beautiful way of just calming things down. And I just love that. I also think if you take your mind back as well in um, Abraham, if you go back to, to Genesis, he was a servant of God. So when the angels actually came, Abraham was at his tent and then he rushed out and then he served them. He made them a meal and spoke with them and just waited on them. Right? That's what Abraham did. But then God actually showed Abraham what he was going to do. And that's where he took him over and he seen Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that. And what he was actually going to do in those, those towns. Right? But then what I loved about Abraham as well is then he also spoke about, well, what if there's one righteous person in there or, or, or 50? And then he started bringing it down. He then became friend. And that relationship then changed to being a friend and a negotiator. Moses did the same kind of role as well. King David did the same kind of role. We're called to do the same kind of role. We are friends of God or friends of Jesus. What an awesome place to be. So, friends, as we're preparing to wrap things up this morning, um, I want to talk about the last piece, and that's our spiritual discipline and our framework. So Alison last week shared, was it last night? No, two weeks ago, shared this picture. Can we all see the artwork that Alison made? It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's the fruit. But when Alison showed me that, I got super excited because I look kind of look past the fruit. The fruit's essential and it's really, really good. But what's the quintessential part of that picture? Well, for me, the quintessential was the spiritual discipline or the framework around it. The framework around it to make the fruit be in a nice spot. So if there's no framework, where would the vine grow? It would grow on the ground. The fruit would be on the ground. A lot of fruit would be lost. How do you maximise productivity? You make it grow up a spellier, right? That's how you maximise your productivity. That's what Jesus is wanting us to do, in a spiritual discipline. So what is our spiritual discipline? Well, I think there's three key areas. There's prayer and God's word. When we talk to God, have a conversation with God, it's phenomenal how that adjusts our attitude. When we read God's word, it's amazing how God challenges us and directs us through his word. Solitude, openness and a Sabbath. Now, these area, this area is where I've got to focus a bit more of my life. Right? 
So I kind of want to serve God and continually work for him, but God's been challenging me and going, David, you need to learn to play with me. All right? So have some fun. Play with me. I'm still discerning what that exactly looks like. You know. Um, and then other times God has actually said to me, do less for me, but spend more time with me. I kind of understood that one. But now he's challenging more to play with. So that's going to be interesting for myself. But it, it's an important aspect. So if we don't have the solitude, the quietness and that Sabbath, we can't get the rest we need from the work that we're doing. In chaplaincy, I can, it can be exceptionally stressful what you're walking to. What I found is, connected to Christ, well, I'm okay in that situation. You know, I've tapped right in and God is leading me all through that. And I'm energised and I'm, I'm terrific. A day later, <laughs> I'm pretty flat. Right? And, and that's that bit where God's actually saying, for the work I'm asking you to do, I'm energising you, but then you also need to have that time away to replenish yourself, to recharge yourself so that you can then get in and go again. Right? And I think that energising us is also that passion that we have right, for the work that we do or where God's called us to be. It's that passion. And then lastly, I think church fellowship with one another is absolutely crucial. We can't be fully connected to Christ if we're not connected in community. We just can't be. So that's why coming to church, being in a home group is so, so crucial and so, so beneficial. So as we bring our message to today to a close, take some time now and in the days and, and the weeks to come, I want you to think about your thoughts and your actions over this last couple of weeks. Do they reflect the heart that has been in a close relationship with God? What are some of the steps you're going to take to help establish a regular rhythm of spending time with God? How are you going to do, do that? How's that going to look for you? Because the bottom line of our message today is each of us is as close to God as we choose to be. Right? The onus is on each and every one of us. How close do we want to be to Christ? And we've got that ability. We can adjust that. We just have to make ourselves accountable on that. Right? I know for me, I want to be more, more in there. That's a journey. And that's the beautiful part about it. That's a journey. So as we're going to lead into communion, I'm going to take this into communion now. We've got to be pretty exciting, as Stephen mentioned. Uh, Olivia and Hannah, they're going to come up and they're going to sing for us. And they're going to sing a song which is called We Dance as a way of how we connect to Christ. And I'm, I'm so, so looking forward to that. So ladies, if you'd like to come up, and I'm just going to, to pray for us now as we come into communion. Because communion is a time when we do come together with Christ, wasn't it? isn't it? We come together as a body of all of us, but we also come together as an individual, as our connection back into Christ. So I pray that this time in our communion is our way where we reset, and for each of us we ask that, we choose. How do we choose, or each of us choose, to be close to God as we want to be? May we all choose to be a lot closer to Christ today. So, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for communion, Lord. We thank you for the ability that we have to come before you to take the cup, take the emblem, and reenact what you did in the Last Supper. Reenact the importance of what you did with your disciples. We are your disciples now, Lord. We are your friends. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to come before you now both collectively as a church group, but also individually as an individual friend of you. And re-establish that relationship. May we continue to grow and know you more and more intimately as you take us on this journey of what we call life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, ever so much. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen.
Thank you.